Thank you. You may be seated. All right. Well, let's take our Bibles here this morning. Let's go to the book of John, chapter number 14, if we could. John, chapter number 14. Adolf Menzel created a painting titled Frederick the Great's Address to His Generals Before the Battle of Lethen. This historical piece depicts Frederick's speech to his generals in December of 1757 during the Seven Years' War before their famous battle against the Austrians. Menzel worked on it from 1859 to 1861, but he never finished it. The monumental painting contains the background and the generals standing in a semicircle, but the main figure of Frederick the Great was left blank. Menzel's famous painting is a picture of many lives. The background of career, interest, pursuits, and achievement is complete. The faces of significant people like family, friends, and colleagues surround. But the central and most important figure is left incomplete. Jesus. Jesus Christ has been given a name that is above all other names and rightly deserves to be the focal point of every single life. Likewise, the centrality of Christ in a life is the greatest need of every person. May we never foolishly allow him to be a blank figure in our crowded lives. Jesus Christ is the most important figure in human history and for many reasons that exist. One significant one, though, is the fact that he holds the details we need to know about eternity and how to get to heaven. Every person will die one day. We have to understand that today. One day, every person here, all of us, are going to die. Every person. And none of us know that day, do we? But Jesus came so that we could be prepared for that day. As he expounds in our passage today. John chapter 1, or chapter 14, excuse me, verse 1. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also, and whither I go ye know, and the way ye get know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Today we're going to examine our passage a little bit more closely as we consider how Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful today for the Lord Jesus Christ and how he is our focal point. Lord, he is our creator our Savior, our Sustainer, our Companion, our Friend, our Guide, and so many other titles that we could give Him. Father, today, may we be able to look into this passage and appreciate Him all the more and understand some very essential truths about who He is as God. We ask Your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the setting of our text is about the time of what we sometimes refer to as the Last Supper. Jesus is having the final meal between him and his, and his uh, disciples there. At this point in the supper, if you will, Judas has already departed. Judas is gone. He's going, out, he's going to get the mob that's going to eventually take Jesus away to be crucified. Jesus, at this point, had already instituted the practice of the Lord's Table or Communion, which is a commemorative practice for members of a local church. And now he's teaching some final sessions to his disciples before he goes to the cross. And he's alerting the disciples that he will be leaving them physically. And it's causing some troubling feelings amongst them, and you can understand couldn't you? They were concerned about that. Our chapter opens up with the Lord, again, like he likes to do, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. You know, God is a calmer. (laughs) Been stressed out at all this week? You know, God wants to calm your soul. 
fearful of something, God wants to help you rest a little bit. And that's kind of what he's doing here. He's trying to calm the disciples down a little bit. Because they're getting a bit concerned about what he's talking about. He was going to let them know that he's not going away forever. But he's going to prepare a place for them in heaven. Amongst the mansions there. And it will be waiting for them either to come either by death or his return so that they can be with him forever. That's the whole point of what he opens up with in the first three verses. And Jesus tells them, you know the way. Seeming to infer that they're not going to get lost <laughs> between here and getting up there. I'm not, you're not, you know the way, you won't get lost. But Thomas, Thomas has always kind of been the nervous Nelly of the group. If you look at his life, I mean, he's the one that was doubting after the resurrection. He's, he's kind of, he says some foolish things, and he, he's kind of a, just seems like a very nervous person. And he pipes up, verse 5, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? I mean, he's, he's very nervous. At least that's the way I read into it. But Jesus responds with one of his most famous statements. I am the way the truth, and the life. And there's a lot wrapped up in those three points right there. A lot wrapped up in it. Because he's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody gets to the Father or heaven unless I'm involved in the process. Now this famous phrase starts off with, I am. I am. Sound familiar? It's the, it's the name, it's the phrase, if you will, the title, God Revealed Himself to Moses, there on Mount Sinai, back in the Exodus. Exodus three thirteen through 14, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And periodically throughout the ministry of Christ, he would refer to himself as I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I, I am, you know, fill in the blank is really what it means. I, I, I finish the sentence. <laughs> and here he is saying I am, and then three points, way, truth, and life. You know, one of the biggest flashpoints during the life of Christ that still exists today is the answer to this question. Who is Jesus? Now, most of us say, oh, we know who Jesus is. Yeah, you do, but you have to understand the depth of that question in respect to his personage. Because the big question in his day was, was he a man? Well, he looked like one. He looked like just a regular old Joe, as we might call it. Or was he God? Well, he certainly acted and spoke like it. So there were always questions that swirled around him. If he was just a man or if this was God. And the Bible mentions a few times in the book of John how there was a division amongst the people <laughs> over this very question. Is he man or is he God? Well, in all reality, he was both. He was 100% man and 100% God at the same time. Say, so how does that work? Ask him, I don't know. <laughs> but that's what it is. He, he was that. But his identity as God is very critical. Because it places Jesus Christ on a very unique platform. If you go to Matthew 16... Jesus went to the area of Caesarea Philippi, which is in the way north there in Israel. I've been there a few times. It's a very mountainous, very rugged area, lots of cliffs and things like that. And there's a lot of things that he's going to teach them up there. But one of the very first questions he asked them is recorded here in 
this series of verses. Look at verse 13 of Matthew 16. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now maybe you've read that before, and you, you're like, why is he asking this question? There's a point. And they said, well, some say that thou art John the Baptist. In other words, John had, of course, been beheaded by Herod, and he was dead, so they thought, well, maybe he's resurrected. Herod thought that. Herod, I believe it was Herod Agrippa, if I remember correctly. And some say Elias, or Elijah, had come back. Elijah hadn't died. He had gone to heaven there in the Old Testament, a fiery chariot. They think, well, maybe he, he's come back. Or, or maybe he's like Jeremiah or, or one of the other prophets. He, he's, he's a man with special unction from God. But verse 15, he asked them another question. But he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And verse 16 is telling. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What is he saying? You're God. And there's a big differentiation between God and a prophet. A prophet is a man empowered by God. This is God himself here on earth. A big difference here. This isn't a man. Just a mere man. This is the God man. This is God in the flesh. And that, that is so critical. Because that belief impacted how they chose to respond to his teaching. Just like it does for people today and, and us. You and I have to decide if this is actually the word of God or the words of men written down. That's a choice every person has to decide for themselves. Is this what God has written down? Is this God's literal words for us? Or is this just a collection of really interesting things that different men wrote over the years. And that's where people sometimes respond when they talk about if you believe the Bible or not. Well, it's just a bunch of writing from a bunch of chauvinistic men of the past. No, these are the words of Almighty God. Amen. And Jesus' words were recorded here. Here within these bo in this book. And that impacts us. Because if these are the words of God and, and Jesus is God, well, that puts a whole new light on things, doesn't it? Go to John chapter number 6. In fact, Jesus had this little habit, which kind of is contrary to what you might see in the day and age in which we live. Jesus seemed to like to thin out his crowds sometimes. <laughs> you know, most people like to try to build the crowd, right? But no, Jesus will thin them out. Say, so why does he do that? Because he wants to separate those who are serious and those who are not. And in John 6, there's the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. They want to make him king after that because, why? Wow, look at this. This guy just has to speak and he feeds us. Well, Jesus didn't want to do that. He, he blessed them once, but he, he didn't want them dependent upon him constantly doing miracles and they just sit home and be lazy and do nothing. But he takes off, there's, there's a scenario that takes place with the, with the, the disciples on the Sea of Galilee and, and uh, getting out of that mess and so forth. And now they're on the other side. And the group of people that had seen the miracle ran, went running over to that part of the lake. And they came seeking Jesus. And, they, and he starts talking to them how, you're not here for me, you're here because you got fed. He got fed. And he said, labor not for the meat that perish, but labor for that which is, brings eternal life. And he goes on and expounds his sermon called, I am the bread of life. In essence, that he is, he is the thing that we partake of to inherit eternal life. There's a lot of things that he says in this chapter, but it kind of comes to a close here. In verse 59 of John 6, these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum, Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? <laughs> this is a hard saying. But who is it coming from? God. Right? God. But they're, they're, they're in a position where they're sitting there thinking here a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, this kind of goes against everything that we think and what the world's saying. 
Verse 61, when Jesus knew it in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? <laughs> he doesn't go, I'm sorry for offending you. He says, does this offend you? What, and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto the Father except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Well, he's too straight. But he's God. I guess he has the permission to say what he wants. So a bunch of people left. I mean, there were multitudes of people. Let's just say that the chairs emptied out in the synagogue. It was pretty blank. It was just Jesus and the twelve <laughs> that were left. And Jesus turns to them, to the twelve, and he, and, he, and he says, verse 67, Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Now Simon Peter speaks for the group and answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We know that you're God. That's why we're sticking here. Wow. See, how you and I view Jesus will depict how we respond to him. If we don't think Jesus is all that serious... We'll find every excuse to get away from his word. Just like these people did here. But the ones that are true blue and really want it, they, they know where the truth is and they will stick by it through thick and thin. Regardless if it's popular or not. Because Jesus is God. That's what it comes down to. Now, in our day, that question still buzzes around, believe it or not. Because you ask people, what do you, who is Jesus? A lot of them will consider him to be a good man, a good teacher on some level, did a lot of good things. But there are many people that believe he is equal to all other major religious figures that exist. And some common ones are, of course, like Muhammad and Buddha, Confucius, Mary, Joseph Smith. The list goes on and on, depending on what part of the world you're in. But if Jesus is God... He surpasses all of them. Right? That puts him on a platform all by himself because nobody's above God. Actually, this is a cardinal doctrine of Christianity. If Jesus wasn't God, then everything about Christianity is nothing but an opinion. And in essence, can be taken with a grain of salt. Because it's built upon the ideas of a mere man. But if he is God, then what he teaches is absolute truth that we must submit to. Because he is God. What do you believe? What do I believe? What do you believe today? About Jesus Christ and what he said. I'll testify here personally. I believe he is God. I believe he is God. And as God, his statements about being the way, the truth, and the life hold significant meaning that I'd like to just expound here as much as I can, but as briefly as I can here this morning. As we talk about, first off, when he calls himself the way. Remember the question, how do we know the way that Thomas asked here? So how do we know the way to those mansions in heaven to where you're going. And Jesus, of course, responded, I am the way. Which indicates that he, being God, has, exclusive, has the exclusive and only means of getting a person to heaven. Very exclusive. That's a pretty narrow viewpoint in our pluralistic day and age. We're all ways lead to the same spot. 
But he says he is the way. Singular, lone way. There is no other way. He doesn't even say he's the best way. Or the greater way, or the better way, or the best, you know, all those words. No, he says very singular, the way. Very narrow viewpoint. You know, it's said that the ancient city of Troy had only one entrance, and that from whatever direction travelers approached the city, they could only enter through that one legally appointed entrance. Just like Jesus is the only legal entrance into heaven and to the Father. Again, very popular idea in the day and age in which we live that all roads lead to the same place. In other words, all faiths, if you will, lead to the same place location, heaven. And that sounds really nice, and that sounds very, oh, let's you know, get along with everybody, and that's great. But Jesus' statement here blows that idea right out of the water. That's why you can go in certain places and, and, and pray in anybody's name, and even in the name of God, but if you use the name of Jesus Christ, whoo, boy, you set off the fire alarms. Because Jesus is very exclusive here. Makes him a little bit on the divisive side. But that's what he said, and if he's God, well, I can't really argue it. I can just tell you it, and that's that. And you have to decide for yourself. But what about all these sincere people going another way that, feel, that they feel is right for them? You know, that's the day and age we live in. I just feel this is right. Can I say feelings matter, but truth trumps everything? Because you can feel really good about a lie, but you're not going to feel good when that lie is exposed. Many people living a lie that one day collapses like a house of cards and their life falls apart. Like, what has happened? You built your life on the sinking sands instead of the solid rock of the truth of God. That's what it comes down to. That's what it very much comes down to. They may feel it's right for them, and, and, and of course that's a very popular idea, ideology. This is what's right for me, and that's right for you, and you know it's, it's all okay. Well, according to Jesus, there's nothing wrong with sincerity. I think we have to have a sincere faith. But sincerity is not going to get you across the finish line. Because if we don't obey what God says, and Jesus being God, then you're not going to get there to heaven. It's just not going to happen. Go to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus, again, uses some very poignant words as he closes off his Sermon on the Mount. You know, you know it's funny, when I was growing up and I went through uh, my, my catechism classes and all these things that I went through as a kid, they never mentioned any of this stuff that I'm going to show you. I remember sitting in a college Bible study and the, the guy speaking showed me that and I was like, I've never seen that before. But it's very, very telling words as he kind of brings his sermon to the close. He says here in verse 13, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way which leadeth, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and there are few that, they that find it. Basically the idea here is this, the wide broad way is the road to hell. Most people are on it. The way to heaven, according to Jesus, is narrow because that's just through him. He's the singular door to heaven. And there are a few that find it because they want to travel the broad way. And you can travel the broad way. That's your choice. That's a, per that's a personal choice every person can make. God gives you a free will. You can choose your choices, but you can't choose your consequences. Because it goes on in chapter 7 there in verse 21, the consequences of choosing your own way. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name done many wonderful, or cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, that work iniquity. What is he saying here? There are going to be people who speak in his name, do miracles in his name, do good works in his name, but they don't get there because they went the wrong way. The wrong way. 
They tried to go to heaven their own way. Go through their own door that they've made up themselves. But Jesus says in, this, in our passage today, he is the only one who can get a person to the Father. No other way, no matter how sincerely it's followed, will work. Again, that's why the name of Jesus raises so much air in, in the lives of some people, is because they don't like the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. And he was pretty exclusive when you read his words. So why, And again, it makes people upset because people don't like his way. It's narrow. It is. And they want to make their own way. Yet our helpless state as sinners does not give us room to negotiate with God on the terms of our redemption. You're not in a position to negotiate. Okay, God, you want my soul? Let's talk this through here a little bit. I'm going to do these good works. You're going to accept it and you're going to let me in. Got it? That's the way people are treating God with their redemption at times. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it how I think. You're not going to tell me any different. And God says, that's not how it works. I'm the creator, not me, him. <laughs> okay, just to clarify. <laughs> I'm the creator. Stepping in here. All right. I'm the creator. You're in a helpless spot. I'm going to do what I believe is right, and you need to accept that, or else you don't have any hope. You don't have any hope. You know, you go to the bank, get a loan for a mortgage. You don't sit across from the banker and say, well, banker, you want 8%, I'm going to give you 2%. Yeah, some of you are laughing. You're like, yeah, right, try that one. You know what they would do? They'd tell you to say, bye-bye. You're going to pay it off in this amount of time, this amount of years, this is the way it's going to be. And most of us don't have any room for negotiation, do we? The only way you can improve on that is if you have a lot of money that they want. None of us are in that position. We're all bankrupt spiritually. We all are dead in sins. We are all hopelessly hell-bound and need Jesus Christ to save our soul from that position and put us on the road to heaven. We are in no room to negotiate whatsoever. We can't, we can't do that. That's why Jesus says he's the only way to heaven. All other ways, according to him, are dead ends. Dead ends. Secondly, he is the truth. Now, as God, again, we want to establish the fact that he was God, he establishes what is truth. In other words, what is right and what is wrong? What is true, what is error? He's the one that determines that. And in a world that doesn't know God, what is truth is certainly debated. In fact, we've evolved to the point in our society, in our society that everyone can live their own truth. So what do we have, 340 million people in America and 340 million truths? That's a recipe for disaster. There was a time in Israel's history where people lived like that. It was called the Judges. The Judges conclude with this verse, Judges 21, 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's living your own truth right there. Well, I believe this is truth. And I think this is truth. And that is truth. And, and we can live our own truths and live in harmony. That doesn't really work. It didn't in Israel's day. If you read the Judges, it was constant societal chaos. Much like what we're getting in our own nation today. Chaos. Everyone living their own truth and there being no absolute truth, which is kind of an oxymoron when you think about it. Because if there's no absolute truth, that itself has to be an absolute truth. Right? Pilate himself, if you go to John 18 as Jesus was facing him before his time on the cross, Pilate was going through a lot of inner turmoil because of things that were being said and going around and thinking that okay, initially this was just some guy the Jews wanted to deal with, but then he discovers he's dealing with somebody more than just a man. He was God. And, and Pilate knew there was something different about him. 
And there's a long story we could get into, but there's something that's said in a back and forth between him and Christ here in John 18, verses 33 through 38. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my, would my servants fight, and I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now in, is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? Boy, that's the question today. What is truth? Is this word true? The word of Jesus? What he's saying or is it not? Everyone has to reconcile that in their own mind at some point. And Jesus states here, he is the truth and he came to testify of it. And one thing you begin to realize in the world that we live in is that truth isn't popular. You'd think it would be. I mean, who wants to live a lie? But actually, that's the way a lot of people want to live. And those who speak it sometimes take it on the chin from those who prefer to live a lie. <laughs> that's exactly what happened to Jesus and many others throughout the course of time. But as God, Jesus is the source of absolute truth since he was the one who built this creation established its order and moral laws that were reflective of his perfect character. As creator, he has the legal right of that. But again, that means that his teachings and character are true regardless of what anyone else says or does contrary to them. Second Corinthians 13.8, for we can do nothing against the truth before the truth. In other words, you can't make truth not true. The only thing you can do is help propagate it. <laughs> you can do it for the truth, but not against it. You can't do anything to nullify it. Now, people have tried, but truth always prevails in time, though it might be slow getting out of the blocks. There is a cliche that goes something like this, a lie gets around the world before the truth puts its shoes on. Boy, isn't that the case. You know, they'll, they'll propagate a lie as quickly as possible, and then over the course of time, the truth bubbles to the surface. It always does. Be careful what the media tells you, because I'll tell you this much, the truth will eventually boil out, as it has in recent days on a few issues that we've seen that were so big just a few years ago. The truth always boils to the top. You can't suppress the truth. It always comes up. It's like... I think like a balloon, if you push it underwater, it's just going to come back up. It's just going to come right back to the surface. What is true will always reveal itself. Truth has the ability to expose lies. Truth is light. It particularly illuminates the mind to falsehood. Satan is the father of lies, of falsehood. That's why we want to align ourselves with the truth as much as we can. Because the last thing you want to do is live and propagate a lie. But he has, Satan has convinced many people to believe such lies that they will even give their very life for them. According to Jesus, we want to know the truth, examine his words and his life. Because they are credible. If he is the exclusive way to heaven, then he has to be true. The last thing you want to do is believe something about eternity that isn't true. How would you like to sincerely believe something for so long and then die and find out it was wrong? That's what you see in Matthew 7, though. People that believe something for so long. How do I know what's true, though? I believe that if you want to know the truth, it will come and hit you right in the face. I know that's true. The second thing, though, you'll have to decide whether or not to embrace it or not. I have seen people, there, there's an instance in the, in the scriptures of a man, he's called the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus and says, what, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? He wanted to know how to get to heaven. Well, boiled down to basically he having to turn his life over to Christ, getting saved, if you will. 
but then he walked away sorrowful. You know, sometimes people say they want the truth, but it turns out they really don't want it. Because of various things in their life. Look at, look at it this, this way. The last thing you want to be is wrong about your eternal state because hell is a very, very bad place that no one ever, ever escapes. And you want to be make sure that you're right. And Jesus here wants you and I to know the truth. He is the truth. Look, you're going to put your trust in something for eternity. You're going to put a trust in someone's way, your own way, or Jesus' way. You and I get to make that choice. Which one is going to be it? I believe personally he is true. I put my trust in him 25 years ago plus, and he has never failed me. Can you testify like that? That I, that I trust him completely because I believe he is true. That's what he's saying here. I am the truth. He is the source of truth. All truth stems from him in some capacity. Well, thirdly and finally, he is the life. Let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter number 1. The book of John, the gospel of John, if you look at each of the gospels, they were kind of targeting a different audience that was around in the time. You had the book of Matthew that was really geared toward the Jewish mindset. The book of Mark is really geared towards the Roman mindset. You have the book of Luke, which is geared more towards the Greek mindset, though we all can benefit from it. Don't, don't take that too far out of context. But the book of John was really to expose Jesus as the Son of God, as God. And John opens up his gospel this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Say, who is the Word? Well, verse 14 tells us, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It's Jesus Christ, okay? The same was in the beginning with God. You see the eternality of Jesus Christ. He, he didn't just come to existence at Bethlehem's manger. He has always existed from eternity past, just alongside the Father and the Holy Spirit, the other parts of the Trinity. And it goes here, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Speaking that he was the creator. Jesus was the creator. He was the one saying, let there be light. Let there be this, let there be that. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. It tells us here that Jesus is the author of life. He has power to give life, both physically and spiritually. The reason you have life today is because God gave it to you and to me. He was the one that made it possible for you to come into existence. He was the one that when you took your first breath of life, you, it came about. He was the one that gave you your soul. He was the one that made you. He's the life giver, physically and, of course, eternally. God created life. He sustains life, and he defines it, too. Without Jesus Christ, life wouldn't exist and wouldn't make any sense at all of why you're here. Now, I understand there's the idea of evolution, where we all, over the course of billions and billions and however many billions of years you want to attach to it. We came about as a result of processes firing in a correct sequence that eventually brought about life and eventually we evolved into what we are today. And the idea of evolution is really the, the, the main objective, if you really look at it, is we're trying to erase the need for God in the equation. That's what it, that's what it amounts to. But there's some big holes it provides no, uh, or, or this theory has big holes in it in the sense that it provides no purpose of existence at all. What it states in so many words is that you and I are nothing but just a big chance, big accident, if you will. And you have no real purpose in this life but to get everything you can for yourself. 
it's a very self-oriented type of philosophy where the strongest will rule and will survive. It's the, and the weaklings will die because their life isn't worth much. That's the basis of that. I, that's what it drives you towards. That's why it's the basis of communistic and socialistic governments and why in, in, in time past, so many went to death because it was the strongest survive. It's a very concerning philosophy. God is life. With him, every life matters. Isn't that good? Every life matters. It doesn't matter who they are, what they came from. It doesn't matter their physical limitations. It doesn't matter their color. It doesn't matter anything. It matters that they are created in the image of God and that life was created to fulfill a divine purpose that is bigger than themselves. There's nothing better than that. That should be celebrated, not dismissed. That's, that's the beauty of God, is that he created everybody, and that everyone's got a purpose, and that central purpose is to glorify him. Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. God created us to do his good pleasure. Bring him glory and honor, which brings us joy and brings him joy. That's the kind of God we serve. He's the God of life. He gives your life meaning. He gives you a reason to get up in the morning. He gives you a reason to live each day. He gives you a reason to get through the challenging times of this life because there are some greater things that he wants to accomplish in, with your life. Your life isn't a waste because Jesus is the life. As author life, he knows its purpose. He knows how to sustain it both now and forever. Because one day we're going to die, right? We're going to die. We're going to get on to the other side. And he's the one that's going to bring you home. If you take his way. And his way, according to him, starts with being what's called born again. It's a time in your life where you recognize that you need God to save your soul from the direction your sin is taking you. And that is hell. Every, the, we as sinners are on the road to hell. Jesus died so that we, he could take us off that road and put us on the road to heaven. But we must all come to a point in our life where we recognize that need and come to God in his terms. We must be willing to forsake Sin is the attitude of repentance where we are willing to turn from sin to God and be willing to go in a new direction in life, away from sin. There must be that seriousness about sin that must be understood. We come in agreement with what God has to say about it anymore. We're not going to, uh, you know, we want to go in a new direction in life. We don't want to offend God anymore, even though we will, but we, we have a different attitude towards our sin. That's what happens when a person truly wants to, is ready to be saved, is that they understand that sin is not good, and they want to run from it. Then there's the faith aspect, where we trust Jesus Christ alone to atone for the sins, and no longer anything that we've ever done before. If you died right now, can I ask you a question? What would you say to God if he were to say, why should I let you in? Why should I let you in? Well, I was baptized. I went through this program. Um, I'm a pretty decent person. I'm a good neighbor. I'm a good citizen. Maybe you are. But that's all you think. That's everything you can do. He is the way. You have to trust his way, and that is putting your faith trust completely on him and him alone. When you're willing to do that, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I did that, like I mentioned earlier, over 25 years ago. Many here can testify of a time and a place where you did that too. But maybe today you can't. My hope and my goal was to push you in the direction of Jesus has the answer. Seek him to get it. Because the last thing you want to do is just leave your eternity up to happen chance. 
and assumptions and hopes. You want to know for sure that the minute you step through death's door, you're in the right spot. He, Thomas said, what's the way? Jesus said, I'm the way. Only him and him alone. May God help us to accept those thoughts from his word. Let's take a few moments and stand to our feet this morning as the pianist is going to come play for a few moments. The way, the truth, the life. Do you believe today, with heads bowed and eyes closed, that Jesus is God? Do you believe he's God? If you do, <laughs> good. I believe, I believe that's what this book teaches us. Then secondly, do you believe that he holds the way? That he knows the way to get to heaven. That he is, what he says is true and that what he possesses is all that we need to know about this life and the one to come. A lot of things wrapped up in that phrase, isn't there? And maybe today you've never been saved, though. You've never been born again, as I mentioned a moment ago. But you'd like to be born again. You'd like to be that. As the pianist plays here today, if that is your need, I encourage you to, to respond to that. I'd be glad to take you aside after the service and show you from God's Word how to be born again the Bible way. Or I can have somebody that, that knows as well to do the same. The whole point is, it's not becoming a member of this church, it's not giving to this church, it's not serving in this church or any church other than that matter. It's him and him alone. And that's what we, the goal today is to point you and I to him. Today, if we have embraced him as in salvation, you know, he's got commands for us to follow and to obey and to, to seek to, to fulfill in our life. He's got a purpose for your life. And I want to encourage you to seek that, to know what he wants you to do. I'll guarantee you, number one, it'll be to glorify him in some capacity. Number two, it'll be trying to get the message of redemption, of salvation to others who have not received it yet. And they'll have to make their decision for themselves. The way, the truth, the life, that's who he is. He is God. And as God, he has all the answers. Father in heaven, we thank you for the, the word of God today. Thank you for the words of Jesus. We want to know what he has to say. He, is the, he was the perfect God man. He was God here on planet earth as flesh. We thank you for his example, but also for his truth, for making the way for us when no way existed. And I praise you, Lord God, for his life. Father, I pray that we could emulate him and lift him up so that others might know him and find the peace that he provides for, for this life and for all eternity. We praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here today. Uh, if you do have questions about you know, where you stand with the Lord as far as being born again and what that all entails, we'd certainly be delighted to sit down and have a Bible study with you and, and help you answer some of those spiritual questions if you didn't feel that you had the wherewith to, to walk the aisle. But uh, that's the greatest thing you need to know. Uh, this side of, of heaven is where you will spend eternity. And if you don't have assurance about that, I encourage you to, to get those answers to those, those big questions solved. Uh, a few quick reminders about the sign-up sheets about the Lift Fellowship this upcoming Saturday and then the following Friday, the Fall Fellowship out at the Anderson Home. Please sign up if you could with those. And then tonight, I'm kicking off on another new series. We've got a bunch of new series going on. At 9.30, I started a, a series called Why. We're answering a lot of different questions from a lot of different, uh, on a lot of different topics. And this morning, I started with Why Support Israel? Big question, big topic in the day and age which we live. And we, we started that, and we will continue it on next, Saturday, or next Sunday as well. Tonight, I'll be talking about our, the, the series is called True Love. The world screams the desire for love, but doesn't have a clue how to define it. God is the author of love. He is the, he is the propagator of. He is the essence of love, and he defines it for us. And that's what we're going to look at tonight out of 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 of what love really is. 
And as I was studying, it was like, it, it really was impactful to me, and I hope that it'll be impactful to you. So I encourage you to join us for that tonight. Neil, why don't you come and close with a word of prayer if you could. Thank you. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for, for this morning, Lord. Thank you for just allowing us to, to be here, and Lord, just to meet in freedom and to hear from your word. Lord, thank you for showing us the way, and Lord, just for, for providing uh, the way for us, Lord, that we can be forgiven of our sins and um, and just be able to, to be with you in heaven one day after we die. Lord, I just pray for anyone here that uh, does not know that for themselves, has not been born again. Lord, I just pray for your Holy Spirit to continue working on their hearts until, until each one of them has settled that for themselves between you and them. Father, I just pray that you would Again, Lord, just give us a restful afternoon, and Lord, that uh, you prepare our hearts to hear from your word again this evening. We just thank you for it and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you all for being here this morning. You are dismissed.